Okay, so it looks like we have some watchers now. Um, looks like we have four people watching. Um, so, John, some of the questions I've gotten before um, this started were, um, the first one was, do you really believe that peer review can be done in 24 hours? Um, absolutely. Um, I think peer review can literally be done in an hour. Uh, peer review really requires uh, merely the careful reading of your article or anyone's article uh, and some thoughtful, you know, input back to you, the author. And that doesn't take hours or days or weeks. It literally does take an hour. And uh, those of us who've been in this business for a long time know that most of the peer review process involves procrastination by reviewers. And literally, uh, what is a one-hour task, or even sometimes less, mushrooms into something that takes days and weeks and sometimes even more. And then sometimes just reviewers literally forget about an article, and it only makes it that much harder to get back into it. And meanwhile, there's all kinds of political nefarious things that go on where people kind of sandbag their, their commitment to reviewing an article because they don't want to see it published. So, uh, yeah, I mean, peer review doesn't take that much time. And I'm speaking as someone who's reviewed thousands and thousands of articles in his lifetime. And um, uh, that's just the honest truth. Now, journals try to masquerade behind some complex, intricate process where they think great peer review happens. But ultimately, all that matters for almost all articles is a dedicated hour or so of time from a reviewer. And why do you think it is that people doubt this so much? Um, what kind of uh, uh, information are they getting where they would doubt that peer review could happen so quickly? They're inexperienced. I mean, anybody who says that hasn't done that much peer review or doesn't know much about the process. Now, there can be articles, and I understand, of perhaps amazing social import where perhaps you're talking about... Uh, you know, a breakthrough product for, you know, colon cancer or, you know, how we're going to treat, uh, you, know, you know, hypertension with a new generation drug that's just undergone very, very complex uh, trials. And, yeah, that can take, you know, you know, communication with you know, statisticians or maybe even someone with more specialized knowledge than the first reviewer has. But you're talking about 1% of publications where, yes, you may, in fact, need a higher level of review that goes on, could go on for several days and weeks. But when something is that important, and generally Curious has not yet published that caliber of article, but when it goes published in New England Journal of Medicine, for example, they generally publish those articles pretty quickly because those are often breakthrough articles. And what they challenge everyone to do is just get their butts in gear and get their job done quickly. Again, procrastination is not necessarily an intrinsic part of the peer review process, and yet that is by far the dominant amount of time that goes into doing a peer review of an article. Right, that makes sense. Um, how did you get the idea to start Curious? Well, I think that observation in itself was the impetus for starting Curious. I realized that that uh, people overthought the peer review process. And, um, and the journals were so caught up in their importance, never really focusing on what is important, and that is the article itself. Re I like to comment, journals don't make artic articles great. Articles make journals great. And most journals have this utterly backwards. Um, and that sense of pompousness, the sense of, of imperiousness, just complicates the whole peer review process, slows it down so much. Peer review, the whole process of peer review publication takes too much time. Your right. already rare article, and I just alluded to them, that may require a much slower process. But generally speaking, peer review is there to make sure that the science is legitimate. It's almost impossible to make, it, to make sure it's, it's, it's correct. Pray that. It's almost impossible for the peer review process to make sure the science is correct. Someone could easily, and they often do, not, I hope never in Curious, but we certainly have seen it many times where people fake data, they fake mm -hmm. graphs, they fake images, 
they uh, they actually compo- concoct a fiction. Now, when someone utterly lies, it, it can be very hard for a reviewer to, to discern this. Moreover, sometimes the knowledge is so narrowly specialized, it really perhaps a, a new surgical procedure. The only one who really knows that much about it is the surgeon reporting it. And it's very hard to sort of, you know, kind of undermine their truth without you having any personal knowledge as a reviewer. So what you see is this big system geared, it, telling a fiction that it, peer review, will tell the truth. By virtue of something is peer reviewed means it is truthful. It's just not true. And if we know that, you know, Pretty good data, and my kind of a hero at Stanford, one of them is a named John Ioannidis, and he published a seminal article about 12 years ago um, in PLOS that uh, pointed out that not just some, but the majority, I repeat, the majority of big science data publications in New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, these are articles that have undergone the most intensive review, who have had you know, kind of NIH funding, who've had all kinds of statistical analysis, have had all kinds of complex peer review. Most, 60%, ended up eventually being proven wrong. 60%. So let's understand that peer review is imperfect, and let's get on. And the best way for, I like to say, for bad speech is more speech. And peer review process is a form of speech uh, validation. So let's get through the process, do a, a rigorous job, but never illusion, never, you know, deluding ourselves to think it's perfect, and publish, and let's react to the published article through more articles, more science, because that's how we find truth eventually. Interesting. Yeah, and what do you, who do you think are um, Curious's main competitors? If um, they- well, I, I think we compete with 5,000 other medical journals out there. I don't think today we necessarily compete with Lancet New England Journal of Medicine. I, I'd like to, and maybe someday we will, but uh, there are still, they re- represent a great forum for, for very complex, intricate, important uh, science uh, that perhaps does deserve a deeper peer review process than we're ready to give today. But short of that, I think we can compete with all other journals. And I think, moreover, we are redefining what a journal is. Um, some people felt that, you know, they, they tied their brain in knots and themselves in knots, unable to publish because they felt that something needed to be, quote, unquote, important before it was publishable. And that importance is kind of in the eyes of the beholder and often too much time in the, in the eyes of self-important journals. We feel that if you have a topic of interest, um, very likely there's an audience out there for your topic of interest. And we want to make the publishing and peer review process more informal and thereby accelerating it. There's oftentimes an audience for everything in the world. And places like YouTube have taught us that. So increasingly we are redefining what we think peer review medical publishing is about. And we, I give, you know, the rest of internet, the consumer credit internet, a lot of credit. We see nowadays where in a large number of emerging platforms of, such as Facebook have emerged that have uh, a way of disseminating knowledge much more quickly. Now, the trouble with Facebook is it's uncurated knowledge. And there's, there's, there's a lot of misinformation, literally too much information. Well, that's the beauty of what peer review does. Peer review tries to at least get rid of the most flagrant misinformation, try to focus, do a much better job of finding truth at a first pass, understanding you will never, no matter how much time you spend, ever get utter truth in the publication process. Right. That makes sense. Um, And has Curious faced, um, have they had to have more retractions than other journals based on the speed in which we publish? Um, that's a very good question. Um, my my general impression is no. I mean, we we when something needs to be retracted, we retract it pretty quickly. I mean, the number the leading reason for our retractions, in many respects, is has not been fraudulent science. It's been you know stupid, corrupt things like plagiarism and stealing people's data. 
um, that uh, it's almost impossible for the peer review process to discern. Um, you know, there's, you know, we, all of our articles go through a uh, plagiarism checker, but if for some reason the data source for that plagiarism checker isn't in our database, well, you know, we can publish an article that's plagiarized, and there's just no way any peer reviewer is going to know that. And when someone steals authorship from somebody else and there's other sort of games, um, you know, there's no peer reviewer who's not going to know that. Um, so, you know, it, it, generally speaking, um, retractions most commonly occur because of um, I don't know, illegal or just immoral, unethical behavior. And that's true in other journals as well. So I'd say on average, I don't see that big a difference. Um, but uh, it could be in time our, the informality of our journal. And even more so, maybe some of the, um, we, we are permissive when letting more junior um, authors participate in the publication process. And sadly, those are the ones who do the most BS. So, um, uh, but so far, I don't I think there's any evidence that we end up retracting any more articles than anybody else. Okay. Um, someone says, having published five articles with Curious, my personal favorite thing about Curious is the lovely and lively user interface. When do you think other journals are going to realize this and catch up? Uh, well, I hope never. Uh, we, <laughs> we want to dominate the world. And I'm, you know, people say, well, what's the long ball game for Curious? And, and given the rate of glacial change I see in uh, medical publishing, um, I think we can be the leader for a long time to come. And I do want to literally publish a million articles a year, if not more. And so we have, at some point, journals may start taking their self-importance um, and realizing that the, the importance of what they do is what the authors are publishing, the content itself. Um, and they may try to be nicer to their authors, but, uh, Who's to know? I don't know. I, I hope they never win because I plan to win myself with Curious. Um, so I, uh, but thank you for your um, your kind words. And I say five articles is a good start. Let's do five every year. We'll fall in love forever. Um, also, um, you know, speaking of scaling um, and you know publishing over a million articles a year, how is Curious? poised to uh, scale in that way? How, how, is it, how will that work and how is your configuration set up with editors and so on? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm kind of boasting here and trying to talk big. Uh, you're right. Uh, th the idea of publishing a middle, middle million articles a year is, a, is almost a terrifying notion, but uh, we feel that the general field of medicine can support this kind of communication among physicians. Um, and we have a, a platform that we think can in time scale. You know, we, hello. Um, someone didn't like what I had to say. Um, but having said that, um, uh, it is a continual challenge to keep the peer review process honest and safe is a continuous challenge to keep uh, the editorial process uh, responsive and, and coming to judicious decisions. So we are forever recruiting. Uh, we recruit uh, all the time reviewers, copy editors, um, what we call our submissions editors, many of which um, have some scientific background and their job is to help us cull through the many articles we get, some of whom just are never going to be publishable, and kind of get the, the acceptable content in the hands of our reviewers. And then lastly, we're always looking for people who care enough about the publishing world and would like to, you know, dedicate some time to it, who will be our approval editors. And so if anybody in this call has some requisite experience in the publishing world and would like to help support our mission. Uh, we urge you to reach out to Madeline, myself, or ideally Graham Parker at the journal. So um, yeah, it's a challenge. And, uh, but as we, we're getting close to 10,000 articles this year, we think, 
and uh, that's quite a milestone. Um, uh, but I do believe that the processes we use to get to 10,000 articles will fundamentally help us support to get 100 times bigger still. Madeline, I think you, you're you muted. Yes, I'm muted. Um, great, that's wonderful. Um, somebody just asked, that who's new to Curious, uh, uh, basically, is it free? And um, I'll, obviously, I can answer that. Uh, we do have very strict uh, guidelines for publishing. It's a kind of do-it-yourself model. And um, all of our guidelines are very clearly printed in the author guide. And if you follow those directions, you will publish for free. Um, you know, often people overlook things or um, just get a little lazy and, and they don't, you know, totally follow protocol and then they'll wind up paying what we call as our preferred editing fee um, because we do have to pay our editors um, and the time that it takes to review these articles um, adds up and while we would like to publish everybody for free in a perfect world, um, it's just not possible. So um, basically, if not all the rules are followed, you will have to pay a fee, which is usually around, you know, anywhere from two to four hundred dollars, something like that. So I'd like to, you know, kind of reiterate that to many authors, almost all authors, aspire to publish for free, and we're we're close to fifty percent who do. But we can't emphasize enough that we're really sticklers for detail, and what may seem like an inconsequential you know, error or formatting mistake in your article um, will lead to us charging preferred editing fees. But I personally know that it's possible to publish for free because I have done an article myself just a few weeks ago, which was kind of blinded. And we can see that if you really are work hard and you're conscientious, you can publish for free. And you're looking at a guy who did it just a few weeks ago. And I tried not to gain the system by being editor chief. So, but we know other. We have plenty of people who do this. But you got to make everything right, or virtually everything right. And uh, we are a little permissive. We allow a small set of errors, but it's got to be generally almost letter perfect. And fact is that almost half of our authors can do that. So we know that if you work hard enough, you too can do it as well. Awesome. Um Someone asked, how, how old is Curious? Uh, we're a little over 10 years. We started in, um, in uh, 2009. Great. Um, OK, someone said, I am new to Curious and have published two articles so far. Um, will you consider organizing authorship workshops and training and writing for upcoming authors like us to help us grow in writing skills? If not, can you recommend any organization that does this? Um, that's really an excellent question. And uh, <clears throat> we have not yet had such authorship um, workshops. Um, um, you may have given us a good idea, something that we may want to pursue, Madeline. Um, so uh, I, you know, right now, it, it can tell you, as, an, as a small journal business, it's hard to do everything perfectly. And you sometimes want to focus on something that you do best. And so right now, I would argue it's our software and our efficient editorial processes where we focus the most. Um, I do not know off the top of my head some author workshops, but uh, maybe we want to do something just like on one of these calls right now in the future and focus, um, uh, you know, make it more authorship friendly so that it helps younger authors publish better. But uh, good question. Good question. And uh, Perhaps, Madeline, we can get back to this individual and give them some more thoughts going forward. That'd be great. Um, someone asked, uh, so, so besides uh, publishing, you know, a million articles a year, uh, what are the future plans for Curious? Are there any, any other, like, adaptations or implementations that we're going to make in the future? Well, we'd like to be a disruptive force in medical communication. And historically, journals have always been about, you know, the high priest of, of medicine, you know, often at the big institutions. And uh, I'm a product of some of those big institutions like Harvard and Stanford, where the high priests speak to each other and, and everybody else is fortunate enough to sometimes listen in. Um, we see that as a, that's a, a dinosaur. 
We believe that fundamentally almost all physicians have seminal observations that they can report to others, learn from others, and in aggregate really form a new basis for medical knowledge. And uh, I'd like to point out something, a very sad fact that um, HIV circulated in Africa for 50 years before, you know, literally killing probably millions. We don't, we'll never know. But before it was finally reported in the medical literature here in the United States, you know, out of San Francisco, New York. So <laughs> why is that? Because really people in Africa there had doctors in Africa had no access to peer reviewed medical journals that they could sort of report interesting findings to. Um, and we're going to end that. I mean, Curious is committed to democratizing medical knowledge across all of mankind, you know, in every place, every corner of the world. Uh, and importantly, we think we can be a breakthrough source of medical knowledge that reaches patients. And so today, patients really have the most limited medical resources for most conditions. Yes, for very common diseases, perhaps like diabetes and hypertension, they can get uh, access to pretty good information sources, WebMD or something. But as you start getting into the nuances of medicine, where physicians have to make important decisions, oftentimes, do they, if they're going to have a shoulder operation, do they have one sort of orthopedic surgery do it, one or go to another hospital, have a different type of technology done? If they're going to have, you know, a, a liver operation, if they're going to have endoscopy, if they're, they're going to have uh, some of these uh, GI capsules. I mean, there's just technology, for example, emerging all the time. And yet patients have no access to how to an information source to help to make intelligent decisions. We intend Curious to be that information source as well. So our authors are not only communicating to their colleagues, but they're communicating to literally potential patients around the world. So. Um, if we can be that wellspring of knowledge for all physicians in the world, not just the high priest, and we can be the information source for all patients, and of course, you know, regulatory bodies and hospitals and everyone else, uh, Curious is truly a transformational idea. So we're very happy just doing, serving that, serving that function in the world today. Awesome. Um, this is a really cool question, I think. Um, Someone just asked, how do you see AI affecting the publishing business in the future? Right. No, that's an amazing question. And, uh, and I wish I was smart enough to give you the perfect answer. Um, but I do think that AI tools can help authors publish better and better off, uh, articles uh, with less effort. Uh, they certainly can help our editorial team. Uh, uh, evaluate them um, uh, mostly in terms of their formatting and their content. Uh, I'm sorry, in formatting and the superficialities. I mean, the actual, the knowledge intrinsic in the article, I think we're a few generations away from AI really being able to discern. But we are even already have, we would argue, somewhat of an AI tool. We'd like to say as such is our reference formatting tool is derived from machine learning techniques, and it does help authors to put up a much better reference than they would without being supported with this tool. But certainly going forward, we can see things like punctuation and grammar and formatting all being done better and better and better. The actual logic of an article, I think we're a ways away from uh, having AI be that useful to us. Great answer. Um, Someone just asked, why don't you accept dentistry-related manuscripts anymore? Um, I mean, that's a good question, and we've debated going back to publishing dentistry. We're a little overwhelmed with what we have right now, and we want to make sure we have the requisite domain knowledge to support dentistry articles. Uh, but uh, stay tuned. I mean, I think in time we may get back. Um, we're growing very quickly, and it's just hard to do all things well. And uh, it is true that the bias here is very much um, general medical, even, you know, kind of allopathic medical. That's kind of my, my co-founder and I uh, we're both come from those fields, and that's kind of where we, we understand best. But uh, we've certainly branched out, and uh, osteopathic medicine is now a big part of our business. And in, in turn, time, we may go back to dentistry. Um, so I, I know we also publish in podiatric medicine. So it's uh, just give us time. 
I mean, we had the, we had the Harvard Department of Astrophysics come to me several years back and asked me if I would publish a journal for them. And I just said, you know, we're overwhelmed in medicine. And I just, you can't do everything. So right now we are specialized generally in medicine, but in time I could see us going back to dentistry. So stay tuned. Great. Um, here's a question. Do you believe there is an, any increased potential for conflict of interest in providing author names slash institutions to reviewers in Curious's review process? Um, yeah, I mean, the process is certainly conflict of interest is something that, uh, you know, we take seriously and I believe is all important. And um, I am always conscious that it, it, it infects everything we do. Uh, so rather than obsess over getting rid of conflict of interest, because I think it's, it's almost an impossible objective, it's better just to declare conflicts of interest. And for me, that's my approach. Um, some journals and some institutions think that they can outlaw conflicts of interest and they spend a lot of time policing it. Um, I know that frequently that's not what happens. There are all kinds of back channels where which conflicts of interest sneak into the whole peer review process. I know I could call almost any, you know, because of my connections in academia today, I could call the editor of almost any major journal and I could kind of influence who's going to peer review my article. Um, that's a conflict of interest. Uh, but that's, you know, very commonplace. And especially if you have an important article that you think journals will might compete over publishing. So, um, you know, let's just get ahead of the game and just let declare what our conflicts of interest are and that we are very strict about. And we, stay, we definitely mandate that all our authors de declare their conflicts of interest and our, our reviewers when there's a conflict of interest, but declare those and then move on. And um, in the end, it's, I can assure you, it is stupid in your career if you have a conflict of interest to publish an article and not declare it because it can come back and bite you in the butt. And not a perfect case in point is the uh, pre previous um, uh, chief medical officer at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, who, <clears throat> who sadly four or five years ago failed to declare, was, it came to light that he'd failed to declare conflicts of interest. And his little, his, this is one of the most important positions in the world. His career was destroyed overnight. So uh, just declare your conflicts of interest and let's move on. Um. Will Curious publish um, the spectacular results with radio modulation when? I'm not sure if I understand that. No, I'm, I understand. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's uh, um, to be defined whether we get spectacular results with radio modulation. We're in the, this is my own specific research interest. And for many of you, this is Greek but as a way of using uh, my field of therapy, radio surgery, to not just treat tumors, but to change the neuronal activity of pathologic brain circuits. And uh, we're gonna start treating, and I'm kind of helping supervise clinical trials in this, trying to treat patients with uh, opiate addiction. Um, but um, just stay tuned. Um, I love the fact that someone is interested in this field, and, and uh, if you have a specific interest, uh, reach out to me and my, uh, my Stanford email address, jra at stanford.edu, and I'd love to talk about radio modulation with you. Sorry, I misread his question, and it, it said, will Curious be the first to publish these results? So yeah, that, that makes more sense to me. Yeah, now I get it. Um, great, great question. Um, Perhaps, if, if, but be truthful, if I have Nobel Prize winning work, I will probably not publish it in Curious the first time, I will publish New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet. But if it doesn't go in New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet, yes, Curious will be publishing it. Um, question, why don't you publish medical student survey studies? Uh, be, we don't because we've been inundated with them and oftentimes they're not very well done. Uh, they're underpowered uh, and they're, they just reek of amateurishness. And uh, you know, we want to preserve um, the status that comes with publishing to people who've done the most work that have the most value to deliver. I mean, I'm it just for you have no idea how burnt out I am 
about reading about medical school burnout articles. Uh, we see these like almost on a daily basis. Uh, I could almost have the journal of medical student burnouts. And I'm sorry if that's something that happens to interest one of you, but in another day or age, maybe burnout will not be so trendy. Um, truthfully, if you delivered a burnout article about to us seven or eight years ago, we probably would have published it and been interested in the topic, but it's just too trendy. And so that's one thing I would like to say is there are these cycles that go on in publishing <clears throat> and um, that uh, people should be mindful of. You can use them to your advantage, but you can also be overwhelmed by them as a journal. You know, if like uh, uh, meta-analysis used to be the rage kind of, you know, 10 years ago and then, then or the, right now with burnout articles were a rage and now social equity is a rage, you know, where you can publish something or CRISPR. So these topics kind of go in cycles and, um, but we are literally burned out with medical student burnout articles. So I'm sorry we're not publishing such studies these days. Um, someone just made a comment more or less um, hmm. in regards to the conflict of interest question. One author invited a reviewer and actually gave a dismal and adverse review because of the bitter relationship with his colleague who was the primary author. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, John, but. You're right. I mean, that's, the whole peer review process is, is riff with politics. It, it's always. And we do our best at Curious to kind of transcend that. It's going to be very hard for us to kill an article because one reviewer says something nasty things about somebody or someone. Now, if they're pretty hard in the science, we are going to probably be a little hard in the article and uh, at least require that the author make a very good faith effort to address the criticism. It doesn't mean you have to give relent, give into the criticism, but you at least have to acknowledge it and show them, show us why you think they're wrong. But you're right. This, this is why peer review process is flawed. And this is what made me start curious. You know, many of you don't know my own academic background, but in the, there was a niche of medicine where I am really a world leader. And yet in that niche of medicine, I oftentimes had a lot of difficulty getting my articles published, not because I don't think there was some relevance to what I was trying to publish, but, you know, one of my academic competitors was trying to, you know, kill my ideas. And that drove me crazy. Drove me crazy enough that I started a journal, I guess. So we're, we're sorry if that happens. We're going to always fight it to the best of our abilities. But uh, I guess the nature of peer review will always involve some politics. But I think we'll do our best. We'll do better than almost any other journal in that way. Um, so we're, we have more questions, but uh, we're going to slow down a little bit with answering them because John's going to have to take off here in six minutes. So uh, the next question is, will Curious give priority to Zap? X related articles in the future or will there be a special section in the journal about it? We're never going to give any priority. I mean, obviously my team at Zap uh, acknowledges and understands the, the value that um, Curious provides them and uh, we love Curious, okay, and we use it a lot for that reason. And I would urge other medical device and life science companies who are early in their life cycle who have early and exciting yet preliminary findings to use Curious to report them. But uh, no, Zap is publishing articles in other journals as well, but, but ultimately we, I think we're unique because we see value of Curious primarily because of my involvement. Right. Um, so someone asked, still Curious is not indexed in Web of Science and Scopus. Are you planning to get it in indexed? Uh, good questions. Um, we are trying right now to get in Web of Science. Um, Scopus is, you know, run by Elsevier, and they got their own agenda. You know, if, if there's anybody on this line from Elsevier, um, God bless you. You know, you're part of the, the evil empire. I mean, there's just... Elsevier is a big, dumb corporation out to report it to protect its self-interest, and I don't really have a lot of respect for what they try to do. For us, um, uh, we would really like to get uh, in uh, get uh, indexed in Medline. We'd like to be a uh, that would be for us the ultimate indexing service, and we of course want to get Impact Factor. 
But Scopus, they've, they've just given us a lot of grief trying to get in there, and uh, we just smell politics all over the place. And um, conflict of, not just politics, conflict of interest, speaking of conflict of interest. Yes, indeed. Um, if a manuscript, a manuscript uh, data was found to be fudged, what is the policy of Curious to handle this manuscript? Oh, um, immediately reported to our editors, and we generally work through um, through the medical school from which the article originated uh, and or the hospital in which it came out of. Um, it gets, generally speaking, we've been able to uh, adjudicate um, all those articles. Sometimes we've had, in one case, there was an, a, a hospital, a medical school in Pakistan uh, that uh, refused to adjudicate an article that was, uh, I believe, plagiarized or I can't, uh, can't remember exactly, but it was clearly fraudulent science. And we've banned the whole medical school. So I think it's called King Edward's uh, Medical S School in Pakistan. So we banned the whole medical. So if an institution isn't going to take this fraudulent science seriously, we will be very draconian in our response. Um, but uh, we, everything that you, anything that you deem fraudulent, please report to us. And we have our processes for trying to initiate an investigation, starting with the authors. We'll always be fair to the authors. But if they can't validate the science, this gets quickly kicked up to the medical schools, uh, hospitals, and uh, we've had um, people thrown out of medical school for faking science. So uh, with, this is serious stuff, and we will treat it with the due seriousness that it deserves. Uh, great answer. Um, how would you advise a medical student interested in neurosurgery um, to start their path in research? Um, publish, and publishing curious. Um, Surely, if you have, um, you need a mentor and you want to work with somebody who can help you through the process of, you know, clinical and maybe basic research. Uh, but as you make observations, document them. Don't keep them inside your brain and you know, try to make your mother proud. Show them to the world. And you need to, the peer review process and the publication process is one that gets easier with experience. And so someone earlier asked me a question about uh, workshops. Well, I can tell you workshops could be useful, but the single most useful thing to do is keep writing and publishing, writing and publishing. You get better and better and better with experience. So, and you need, for this, it, it pays to have a mentor, like someone said, a neurosurgical mentor, ideally, and just start publishing. Some of your obs earliest observations may be humble case reports, uh, but in time you'll develop ever more complex skills. You can do more and more complex retrospective studies and prospective studies. And before you know it, you'll be a professor somewhere. Um, but that's how you contribute to the world of science. And, uh, and at the earliest stages, we make it easier, better, and faster, and ideally cheapest, if not free, with Curious. Great. Um, I think this should probably be the last question we take. Um, how I really like this question. How about doing a recently published article on a live stream or a Zoom to explain and educate and engage in uh, dialogue with a live audience? So, I, honestly, John, if you don't mind, I'd like to respond to this a little bit. I would sure. I would love to see Curious um, encourage authors to create videos um, and live streams on social media to explain their work in more detail or um, just, you know, their abstracts at least. Um, because I do think the, the world of video is taking over and of course social media is so active. Um, so we eventually I think would like to be facilitators of this and help people create videos and help promote those videos um, to really spread the word. Because, you know, sometimes in videos you can even help a layman understand very complex uh, topics. We like it, and uh, we'd like to, we can cross from the written media to visual media, and uh, I think we are on the cutting edge from, compared to most journals in driving these kind of changes. So, look, I was a delight meeting with many of you this morning, and uh, if this was well enough received, we'll repeat it again soon enough. So thank you all, wherever thank you, you are John. in the world today. That was wonderful. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us. You take care. Bye-bye.